Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James T. Maynard. Now this week we're venturing into the chilly outskirts of our solar system and beyond, exploring the mysterious worlds of ice giants. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Yoni Brandi, PhD candidate at the University of Kansas, talking about these chilly worlds. So, what are ice giants, I hear you ask? What are ice giants? Thanks. Ice giants are like the cold cousins in our solar system family. Far They're out. not as flashy as the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, but they've got a charm all their own. Now, you likely know a bit about Uranus and Neptune, our resident ice giants. Now, these planets are called ice giants because they have a lot of ammonia, water, and methane, which in the frigid depths of space far from a star freeze in the ice. But these are not giant ice balls, okay? They form a hot, dense fluid in the planet's deep interior surrounding a rocky core. Uranus, the sideways planet, spins on an axis nearly parallel to its orbit like it's rolling around the sun. I must be me. And Neptune, the furthest planet from our sun, has the, str has the strongest winds in the solar system reaching speeds of 2200 kilometers per hour. That's faster than most jet aircraft, okay? But, guess what? Our solar system doesn't hold a monopoly on these frosty worlds. No? Oh, no, 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 no. They're found sprinkled across the universe and other planetary systems as well. Now, our story here begins with the discovery of Uranus in 1781 by William Herschel, who initially thought he found a comet. Imagine his surprise when it turned out to be a whole new planet. Wow, it's a whole new planet. Uranus thus became the first planet discovered using a telescope. Now, this world is accompanied by 28 known moons, including five large ones. Each is named after a character from literature, usually from Shakespeare. Now... What about Neptune? Uh, French mathematician Urbain Joseph Le Verrier first calculated the position of an unseen planet in 1846, and astronomer Johann Gottfried Gall found the planet after less than a night of searching within a single degree of its predicted position. My, that was fast. Yes, it was. Our understanding of these icy worlds has come a long way since then. We've gone from thinking of them as distant, featureless blue orbs to recognizing their dynamic atmosphere and complex internal structures. It's, it's, it's kind of like getting to know someone on a deeper level, except that someone is a giant icy ball of gas and at the far end of the solar system. Next up, we talk with Yoni Brandy, a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas who studies these fascinating worlds. Join us for an interstellar joyride through the cosmos with the Cosmic Companion. Every week, our intrepid host, James G. Maynard, dives headfirst into the wildest corners of science, comedy, pop culture, and history. The Cosmic Companion takes you on a roller coaster of knowledge with entertaining dives into fascinating subjects. James is like your science-obsessed buddy who's always ready with a fun fact at a party. Oh, and what's a yeah. cosmic journey without some quality company? James rubs shoulders, figuratively of course, with the creme de la creme of the scientific world. We're talking brainiacs who decipher the laws of the universe, authors who craft stories that warp space and time, and developers who are building the future. Our cosmic guest list? Oh, it's star-studded. We've had the likes of Neil deGrasse Tyson, dinosaur expert Steve Brusati from Jurassic World, the legendary ocean explorer Sylvia Earle, a myriad of astronauts, actors, and a constellation of other awe-inspiring guests. But wait, there's more. The Cosmic Companion isn't just any show. We've got AI on our side. Hello. I am AI. Huh. Did you know that is a palindrome? We're talking mind-bending visuals, snazzy animations, original music, and soundscapes that'll make your eardrums do the moonwalk. Are you ready to embark on this epic journey? Head over to thecosmiccompanion.net and get ready to laugh, learn, and explore the mysteries of the universe. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Yoni Brande. He is a PhD candidate in 
physics at the University of Kansas studying exoplanets, their atmospheres, and we're going to learn a whole lot about ice, ice giants as well. Welcome to the show, Yoni. Thanks for having me, James. Yeah, anytime. So, um, you know, we're talking in this episode about, um, specifically about ice giants and uh, frozen foods, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> what What is it that makes ice giants so popular, so interesting? So there are a couple of different things. Um, first, the the ice giants proper are the planets in our own solar system, such as Uranus and Neptune, which are gas dominated, but also made up of quite a bit of frozen volatile material. So ices. Um, on Earth, we think of ices as predominantly frozen water. But that far out in the solar system, you can also get frozen methane and frozen ammonia. And basically, these kinds of materials that would be liquid or gaseous any closer to the sun uh, are able to condense and, and make up the bulk of these kinds of solid material on those planets. Um, and when we extend this idea to exoplanets, that is planets that orbit stars other than the sun, um, we typically think of these things as forming relatively far out away from their host stars where these materials can condense form ices and build up uh, solid bits of planets like this and then they tend to migrate inwards towards closer to their stars um, and actually much of the the sort of exoplanet population that's similar to uranus and neptune are not necessarily icy they're much hotter um, but they're still they still were were made up of much of those kinds of icy materials when they were born, uh, and they have now uh, melted and evaporated and become these these um, more typical gaseous planets uh, that we're familiar with. Hmm. So Uranus and Neptune are out at the limits of our solar system. Do we know if those are maybe coming in similarly or? So in our solar system, no, our solar system is relatively uh, stable at this point in time. Um, but as you think of planetary systems evolving over billions of years, um, you can have all sorts of interesting dynamics. Um, and so perhaps the most interesting thing about these planets is that they're the most common kind of planet we see in the galaxy. Um, things that are much more like Uranus and Neptune um, but a little bit smaller and and much certainly larger than than terrestrial planets like Earth. Um, but in their early histories, they migrate either because of the physics of the, the the leftover gas and dust in their disks, or they get gravitationally disturbed by bigger planets in their system. Sometimes you'll see um, systems with a big Jupiter-sized planet and a couple of smaller, uh, you know, sub-Neptune type planets or, or um, terrestrial sized planets. And they're all relatively close by to their, their host stars. And so there could be some sort of gravitational effect there or they all sort of gradually drift inward um, due to, to drag from these, these leftover materials from, from you know, building planets. Hmm. So, so fascinating. Um, so how common are, you said that these were fairly common out amongst exoplanets, but how, how common are they? Do you... Well, so if we think that approximately every star that we can see on average has about one planet, mm -hmm. um, the single largest population of those planets is sub-Neptunes or, or super-Earths. Um, and offhand, I don't have a specific occurrence number, whether it's 50% or 75% or something like that. Um, but uh, intrinsically, these are the most common. And we can figure this out in a couple of different ways because we're only sensitive. Our, our, our ability to discover these kinds of planets is not evenly distributed. Um, we're very sensitive to things that are very large and very close to their, their stars. Um, those sort of produce the largest signals that we can see in, in planetary systems. Um, but as it turns out, those hot Jupiters are actually intrinsically uncommon. So we've discovered a lot of them, but we've basically discovered all of the ones that we could see. And so what you can do is you can actually simulate the kinds of uh, observational studies that we do 
and seed them with a whole bunch of planets and work out based on how many planets we've actually discovered of the the kinds of planets that you initially seed into your distribution. Uh, and that actually gives you sort of the completeness of your surveys. And by looking at the completeness of the surveys, we actually see that planets like, like those are, are actually more common in the galaxy as a whole, even if, um, you know, even if we actually have discovered, although at this point we've discovered quite a few of them anyway, they are the, they, they are the, the largest single population of planets we've seen. Um, but we also know that they are intrinsically the most common type. Hmm. I love thinking about the richness and the diversity that might come with each of these having several moons. That's certainly something that people have been working on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of potential candidate exomoons. So, you know, um, astrophysical signals that, that look like they could be caused by a moon orbiting a giant planet. Um, however, I offhand, I'm not necessarily sure how many of those are predicted to be around planets like Uranus and Neptune. I think typically you go to really large exoplanets for moon studies because much bigger planets can actually sustain much larger moons, and those larger moons are easier to potentially see. So we don't have any confirmed moons yet, um, but this is an active area of study for sure, and it's very exciting. Hmm. And tell us what, tell us about, I love this concept. I love the phrase probably more than anything, but tell us about the Neptune desert. Yeah. So um, early on in, in my work in graduate school, I actually uh, studied a planet that's in the Neptune desert. Um, so in our, in our population of exoplanets that we have discovered, um, you can look at them based on how far away from they are, how far away they are from their host stars and how big they are. Um, and so if you plot this out uh, with um, orbit orbit duration on the x-axis and size on the y-axis, um, you basically see these gaps in the distribution. So it's not that there are even numbers of planets at all positions at all sizes, um, but actually there's this big scoop taken out of the, the distribution. Um, and some of these other scoops that in, in sort of the, the plot are, are obvious places where we just can't find planets. Um, but the Neptune desert, it appears, is real. So if you have a planet that is, you know, these hot Ju these so-called hot Jupiters are much bigger than Neptune and orbit very close to their host stars. Mm -hmm. And we can find them really easily. And we've also found quite a few planets that are much smaller than Neptune and orbit really close to their host stars. And those are harder to find. And so you would think that anything in the middle would be easily discoverable. Uh, and it would be, except we haven't found many of them. <laughs> so that's that's indication that, that you know, these things are actually, you know, intrinsically rare for a reason. And the reasons, um, there are a couple of different reasons that people have been throwing around in theory. Um, number one is once you get really close to the, the stars like this, um, you're subject to really strong radiation. So if you think about how Mars doesn't have a significant atmosphere, it's because solar wind came and stripped off its atmosphere because the Martian uh, crustal magnetic fields don't actually provide enough deflection of those charged particles to, to, to help maintain the atmosphere. And so this process also happens with hexoplanets at a much higher rate because m many of them are, are very close to their host stars. And if you have a planet roughly Neptune sized, it has a big extended atmosphere and over billions of years, it can actually lose much of that atmosphere to radiation from the star. And so if it loses most of its atmosphere, you don't see a Neptune sized planet, you see something more like Earth sized, except in this case, something a little bit bigger than Earth is almost entirely rocks. Um, and if you go much bigger than Neptune, those planets are actually massive enough to hold on to their atmospheres. Um, so this atmospheric stripping hypothesis is one idea. Uh, and there's another idea that um, if you actually look at the, the, the migration of planets in their disks, basically how the planets interact with all the leftover material from planet formation, um, 
larger planets tend to migrate closer into their host stars and smaller planets don't get quite as far in. And so on the higher mass side of this gap, possibly that's more important than atmospheric stripping. And on the lower mass side of the gap, possibly atmospheric loss is more important. And so there, there are a combination of processes that we think actually could be could be shaping the Neptune desert. But it's definitely real uh, and it's very interesting and it's a very uh, interesting um, you know, current part of, uh, of, of, of science. So. Fabulous. And you do a lot of work studying the atmospheres of, of these exoplanets. What's, what are some of the really cool things you're finding? Well, so much of my work has sort of focused on using data from Hubble space telescope. Mm -hmm. And so the thing about Hubble is that we're really mostly sensitive to one molecule in planetary atmospheres, and that's water vapor. Um, so water vapor, uh, crash course of atmospheric transmission spectroscopy. Um, if a planet passes in front of its host star, uh, you can measure how much light it blocks out from the star. And that light filters through the planet's atmosphere. You can pass that through a prism and get a spectrum out. So imagine looking at a rainbow reflecting through a, a window or something like that. Um, all the colors and the visible spec the visible spectrum of light produce a rainbow. Um, but you can also split up all the colors in the infrared, uh, and that would produce the the kind of spectrum you see with Hubble. Um, water vapor has a really strong infrared absorption feature in planetary atmospheres, and it's this feature which is most observable with Hubble. And so you can basically use your knowledge of how much water you see in a planet's atmosphere um, and the size of the planet and the, the sort of guesses you can make about where that planet formed and how it evolved. And you can make some interesting statistical inferences about planetary atmospheres in general. Now, a couple of years ago, the James Webb Space Telescope went up, has a much broader observational range. And now you can see things like methane or carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide or all of these other molecules that we know exist in planetary atmospheres, um, but we just didn't have the ability to see. And so much more recently, I've been working with those kinds of data. Uh, and actually we were on the team that, that made some of the first ensemble observations of planetary atmospheres with James Webb uh, just, a, just about a year or so ago. Wow, that must've been amazing. It really was. And it was, we were trying to coordinate between like 300 people across several different continents. And it was a, it was probably the most exciting work and some of the, the, the most intensive work I've done in my career. I can't believe it. Um, now, as you're looking at these signals, this, this, um, this light being filtered through the atmosphere of exoplanets, um, you know, as you stated, I mean, you can tell some of the chemicals and the molecules that that are present there. And as I understand it, um, some of these gases may under certain conditions be considered to be biosignatures, uh, the signs of the chemical processes of life. And in 1977, of course, radio astronomers at Arecibo found what looked like extraterrestrial life, a techno signature that came across just for a short amount of time and it's called the wow signal. What would you consider to be a wow signal for chemical markers? So I'm not sure that there's sort of any single wow signal that we would be looking for. There are a couple of different combinations of gases that are strongly indicative of life. So on Earth, for example, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. And, you know, molecular nitrogen gas is not exactly spectrally significant. You can't really see just pure nitrogen in, uh, in, in the atmosphere. Um, but we also have things like carbon dioxide. We also have things like water vapor and oxygen and methane. And so in combination, if you look for things like carbon dioxide and methane and oxygen and water vapor, um, in combination where you don't have any sort of obvious 
um, sort of geological or non-biological chemical production of these things. So, you know, you can, we can basically, we have these, these atmospheric models called equilibrium chemistry models. And so you can basically say, okay, for a planet with a certain proportion of heavy elements, what kind of gases do you expect to see in its atmosphere? And, you know, we understand these models relatively well, and they've been, you know, possibly, you know, very useful in investigating these planets. Um, but if you see something like really elevated methane compared to what you would expect from equilibrium chemistry, you have to come up with some sort of mechanism that's producing it. And so sometimes this is, for example, the lofting of, of heavier gases from the bottom of an atmosphere up to the top of the atmosphere, just given like thermal mixing processes. Um, but sometimes, especially in Earth's atmosphere, the proportions of methane and carbon dioxide are much higher than you would expect otherwise, because they're being produced by things like, you know, biology, agriculture, industrial activity, things like that. Um, so there have been a couple of thoughts to say like, okay, well, what is the most unambiguous gas in the atmosphere that's indicative of some sort of intelligent life? And, you know, right. maybe that's something like chlorofluorocarbons, which we were using for decades to destroy our ozone layer because they were really useful refrigerants, um, but then totally got rid of, you know, later on. So maybe you want to look for something like that. Um, but, you know, you would be looking for things at much smaller concentrations. So we, we try to rely on, on, you know, combinations of more common gases and then make, uh, you know, make, make theoretical inferences based on uh, what we know about, you know, assumptions on, on alien biology. So fascinating. And finally, it's, what's next for you? How, what's your next step in exploring the cosmos? So I'm actually moving from pure observing to theory. Um, my most recent paper focused on looking at planetary atmospheres and trying to infer physical properties in their atmospheres based on whether we see clouds or no clouds. Mm -hmm. um, and moving forward in the next few years, um, especially with the uh, really, really, you know, massively improved results from James Webb, uh, we can't, you know, we can make, we can do more than just make broad strokes conclusions about things like clouds and hazes in planetary atmospheres. Um, and so we were just recently funded off of a, a proposal to write some new uh, modeling codes and some computer program software that will actually let people more usefully investigate these clouds and hazes and planetary atmospheres. And so hopefully when this project is done, we'll have lots of new planets to observe and apply our code to and try to actually, you know, nail specific physical properties of these particles that that actually block our view into the rest of these, these planetary atmospheres. So um, that's what I'm working on sort of to close out my PhD in the next couple of years. And uh, I'm looking forward to it being uh, exciting and successful. I'm sure it will be. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Yoni. It was fabulous talking with you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and that was Yoni Brandy, PhD candidate in physics at the University of Kansas. Now, let's take our ice giant love affair mm -hmm. interstellar. Welcome to the world of exoplanets, plants outside our solar system. The hunt for exoplanets has turned up some fascinating characters, including a good number of ice giants. Now, with each new discovery, we've learned more about these intriguing worlds. Some are supersized versions of Neptune, while others are like nothing we've ever seen before. This is like nothing I've seen before. On some of these worlds, enormous atmospheric pressures can press methane into diamonds which rain down through the air. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Our current understanding of these exoplanets is still evolving. It's a bit like trying to understand a book by reading a single page. But every new discovery adds another piece to the puzzle, helping us understand the diversity and complexity of the universe. 
As we continue to explore the cosmos, who knows what we'll find next? Maybe a nice giant with rings like Saturn, or one with moons that might harbor life. The universe is full of surprises, isn't it? On the 8th of April, a solar eclipse will be seen over much of the United States. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we're going to open up the first half of our two-part series on eclipses, talking with famed developer Stephen Wolfram creator of Wolfram Alpha and Mathematica about his new book, Predicting the Eclipse. Make sure to join us starting on the 23rd of March, wherever you found this episode. Subscribe, follow, share, and never miss an episode nor a film. Keep up with our news about our upcoming film, The Wizard and the Scholar, or A Rapscallion Runs a Mucking Ride, coming out this summer. Clear skies.